Hello, and welcome to Ancient Words Speak Today. I'm Pastor Nathan Krauss, and I invite you to join me as together we look into the pages of Scripture to discover how the Bible is still relevant to our lives and how these ancient words really do speak today. Welcome back. We're glad you're here for our next lesson. Um, again, I want to just thank you for being a part of our experience. And those of you who are viewing online, thank you for that too. We're glad that you're part of our study in this journey together to understand prophecy, which will help us be prepared for what is coming to planet Earth. Amazing prophecies. In this lesson, we're asking the question um, on the topic, Revelations 1,000 Years. Will there be a thousand years of peace on earth? And if so, when will it begin? And how will that happen? Where will God's people be during the millennium? Another question for us to answer tonight. And God's word has answers. So before we begin, let's invite God to bless us in our study. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Please speak to us tonight through it. This uh, important and uh, interesting topic of the millennium, the 1,000 years in the book of Revelation, is uh, really something that has been misunderstood by so many people, but we believe your word is clear, and so tonight we ask for you to make it all clear to us as we study your word. We pray for your Spirit's uh, leading and guidance as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. You'll pardon me tonight. I don't know why my tongue seems to be tripping over itself a lot, but... Uh, if I say something that doesn't make sense, just ask me to say it again. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, uh, we're using the It Is Written Bible Study Guide, Revelations 1,000 Years. Question is, how did Jesus describe Satan? Remember in our last lesson study, we saw that he lied to Eve right at the beginning. The very first lie told, you shall not surely die. Well, Jesus said of Satan in John 8, 44, he is a liar and the father of it. That means he's the first one. He's the one who began the lies. And actually, the first lie told on earth to Eve was, you shall not surely die. But that was not the, where lying began. Where did lying begin? In actually in heaven, yes. Because Lucifer, who we now call Satan, was able to convince fully one-third of the angels that they shouldn't trust God and believe him, and they rebelled. They joined him in the rebellion against God. We'll study that in a future lesson as well. Okay. What caused Satan's fall from his high position in heaven? Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14 says this, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend... To he into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And some people have said Lucifer obviously had an eye problem. <laughs> I, 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 five times we read it there. And all I can say is I, 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 right? That's, <laughs> this is terrible. All he's thinking of is what I want rather than being so close to God's throne, right next to God's throne. He should be praising God in his presence and he's turning inward. His heart is, is desiring worship himself. I'm going to be greater than God, he says. I want what he's got. I like how it is that he's, I mean, I'd like to be in his place with that worship. And he says, I want it. And that's where the problem began. That's what caused his downfall. Is it any wonder then that God so hates pride, a proud spirit? Because that's where the problem began. When we are proud rather than humble, we're following in the example of Lucifer who began sin and rebellion against God with his own proud heart. God didn't create him evil but God created all of his beings with the opportunity to choose. We are free moral agents, the angels as well. He didn't create robots because then it wouldn't be love. Our service to him would be mandated. 
And he doesn't want that. He wants us to, he created us for fellowship and love. He wants us to serve him out of love because he gives us everything. He cares for us. He's provided everything. And we say, of course, what's the natural response to someone who showers blessings upon you? I love you and I want to live for you. Lucifer, though, made the choice to say, well, he forgot about that. And he started saying, I want to be in your place. And ultimately, that's really what sin is. That's when we say, I want to be God of my life. I want to choose what I want, and I don't want God to dictate through his law what I must do. We start thinking of his law as restrictive rather than protective, or he's guiding us and protecting us from evil. All right, number three, how successful will Satan ultimately be at receiving the worship of the world? He wanted worship when he was in heaven, and he still wants worship. He wants, since he couldn't get the worship of the angels, one-third of them joined him, but now he wants people to worship him, even if it's in some form or fashion that they don't know it's him. Revelation 13, 8 says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Does that include you and me? It says all who dwell in the, world, in the earth will worship him. Well, let's read on whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the... Oh, okay. If your name is written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, that's Jesus. If Jesus has your name written in the book of life because you've accepted Jesus, then you're not included in that. There's an important thing you need to understand about the book of Revelation. You will frequently see the expression, those who dwell on the earth. Earth dwellers in the book of Revelation, are you, it's a term that's used to refer to those who are not following God. The earth dwellers, those who dwell on the earth. But the saints are a different group. They're not considered in the earth dwellers group. So those who are not following God will be deceived. They are earthly. They are of the earth. They dwell on the earth. When does Satan's domination of planet earth come to an end? He won't rule forever. He's, he's, he's called himself the ruler of this world. He told Jesus, if you'll just bow down to me, I'll give you this world. I can give you everything. He thinks he's the ruler, and he thinks he has uh, rulership forever, but not so according to Scripture. Here's what it says. Revelation 20, verses 1 and 2. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. So he's giving us all these names for him here. And bound him for a thousand years. Hmm. Satan bound by a chain for a thousand years. Is this the thousand years of the millennium that everybody's talking about? A thousand years of peace? We'll see. So it says he bound him for a thousand years. What happens as a result of Satan being bound for a thousand years. Revelation 20, verse 3, it says, He, that was the angel, he cast him, Satan, into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. So Satan is in the business of deceiving people, but he's going to be unemployed for a thousand years. It says, he should deceive the nations no more. So what happens as a result? No more deception. He is bound for a thousand years. How is that? How does God keep him from deceiving? Well, we're going to look at it and we're going to figure it out. But it says, till the thousand years were finished. So there will be, apparently, after the thousand years, there's going to be a time when Satan will have the opportunity to once again deceive people. What event precedes the binding of Satan before he's bound with that chain. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. We looked at this in our last lesson. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. This is what happens just prior to to the thousand years. We'll look at that in a, in a, a little closer in a bit. How many uh, resurrections will there be? Remember, we looked at this in the last lesson as well. 
John chapter 5, verses 29, 28 and 29. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice, speaking of himself, the Son of Man, and come forth. Now, it doesn't say just the saved, and it doesn't say the lost. It says all. So it includes everybody, those who are saved and those who will be lost. All will hear his voice and come forth, but not all at the same time, not all in the same resurrection. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So two resurrections are mentioned by Jesus. The resurrection of life, the resurrection of condemnation. Where does the Bible describe the righteous as being during the, the millennium? Where are the righteous going to be during the millennium? Where does it say? In Revelation 20, verse 4, it says, They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That is good news. So now we have an answer to the question that we said we were going we to ask. At the beginning, we said we'll answer this question. Where will we, God's people, be during the millennium? Living and reigning with Christ for a thousand years. We'll talk about where. John 14, verses 2 and 3. I go to prepare a place for you, Jesus told his disciples. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's what Jesus wants. God created us for fellowship. When he created Adam and Eve, he would walk with them every day. He'd come and spend time with them. He created them for that very purpose. And then when they sinned, sin interrupted that connection. And all God wants is to deal with the problem of sin so that finally the connection will no longer be broken and he can be reunited with the people he loves because he created us for that kind of friendship. And Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place because I want you to be with me. I'm going to come back so that we can be together. <clears throat> all right. I don't know how well you can see this chart. But if the righteous are in heaven during the millennium, where are the unrighteous? Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17. All those who were not saved is who it's talking about. They said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? This is when Jesus returns. They, the wicked, no, have you ever, all right, when you were a little kid, do you ever get caught with your hand in the cookie jar? Or something like that. You know, you were caught in the act. And you, what kind of guilt did you feel? When you knew you were wrong and you were caught, it's like you have no excuse, no answer, and you just feel terrible. You wish you could just, my wife does that when, sometimes when I'm preaching and I talk about her. If she's sitting in the front pew, she's like this. She's just shrinking like I just want to shrink away, you know. <laughs> when I'm talking about what a wonderful, beautiful person she is. She's shy. But... Those who are, have rebelled against God and not accepted the gift of salvation, when Jesus returns, they don't even want to see his face, and they don't want him looking on them. They are actually, it's like, let the rocks fall on us. Just hide us from him. They would rather be destroyed than have to face the one who they are condemned just by his presence, the creator. And notice what it says. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. How many of you have ever been attacked by a lamb? Jesus is the Lamb of God, a yeah, vicious lamb. But just know this, wrath, first of all, we often think of wrath like you talk about the wrath of your mama when she was going to spank you or something, you know, or your daddy. That's, wrath is not uncontrolled explosive anger, not in the Bible anyway. Wrath is not God saying, that's it, I've had it can't take any more, and he loses his cool, blows his top, and boom, you know, I'm going to explode and let you have it now. No, in the Bible, wrath is referring to God's righteous judgment, which is deserved at the calculated time. He is patient and allows things to go so long. He's giving every opportunity for everyone to choose the gift of salvation. But at some point, he says, I'm going to bring an end to this mess. I will not let the world continue in sin forever. And there will be an end. And when God judges sin, that's the only way to bring it to an end. 
And those who choose to hang on to sin and say, well, I don't want to stop being a sinner, they can't be a part of God's new perfect world that he's going to recreate. He wants to restore Eden again. So wrath is what? It's God's righteous judgment against sin. And it will come not when God loses his temper and says, that's it, I can't take it, I've lost my patience. No, it will come when every soul has decided. In the end, when it's, it's too late, the, the book of Revelation tells us there will be a time when everyone has either chosen to be righteous or unrighteous. And then God says, okay, let it be. They've made their choice. They cannot change any longer. Their character is determined by the choices they've made, and they can't even respond to God's spirit anymore if they're lost. And the, and the saved can't change either. They are so settled into loving God that nothing will change them. They would rather die than betray God's trust and, and his, their love for him. So everybody hears, then God says, now it's time for my wrath to be revealed because sin will be judged. So they're saying, who's able to stand? They can't even face him. And uh, it goes on to say, the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So that second rev uh, resurrection happens after the thousand years. They will live again, those that are not saved, after the thousand years. So let me see if I can, do I have a, yeah, I have a bigger picture of this. So here are some things that will happen before, during, and after the resurrection to make it clearer. We've got it in a chart form here. Before the resurrection, in the last days, right before the resurrection will be the return of Jesus. The righteous dead will be raised, those that are sleeping saints in the grave. And saints is what the Bible calls God's people, right? Um, the church doesn't get together one day and decide we're going to give you sainthood and make you a saint because you were such a great person. No, the Bible says you're a saint if you're one of God's people. That's how it refers to the, the people of God. So the return of Jesus happens. The righteous dead are raised to life. The living saints, those believers who are alive when Jesus comes, they are caught up together with those that just came up in the first resurrection, and they go up together to meet the Lord in the air. We read that in 1 Thessalonians 4. The wicked slain, gone. Uh, the wicked are slain. When Jesus comes, the brightness of his coming destroys them, and then Satan is bound. He is bound by a chain of circumstances. We're going to talk a little more about that, but that's when he's cast into this prison, bound with a chain. During the 1,000 years, we call it the millennium, that's from Latin meaning 1,000 years, but it, the word millennium is nowhere in the Bible, okay? But the teaching is clear, the 1,000 years are there, we just use that term to refer to it. It's like the word trinity, you don't find trinity in the Bible, but we use that word to refer to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right, so millennium is what we're talking about. During the millennium, the righteous are in heaven, the wicked remain dead, so we've gone up to heaven. The wicked were killed when Jesus came by the brightness of his coming. They stayed on earth. They're dead. And Satan is bound by a chain of circumstance because he has no one to tempt now. The righteous are gone. The wicked are dead. And it's just him and his evil angels left. It's like God says, uh, go to your room. You're in time out for a thousand years. Now think about what you did. <laughs> and we'll see at the end. It doesn't do any good to be in time out. He doesn't change his character at all. He's still rebellious. Uh, but there's that, and it's not, that's really not the purpose that God gives the thousand years. We're going to see there's a reason why these thousand years and what happens in heaven is important. But nonetheless, Satan does have a thousand years in which he can contemplate his choices that led to this, and it still doesn't change his character. Um, during that thousand years, the righteous will judge in heaven. We're going to look at that and we're going to fill this all in. I'm just showing you on the chart now. The righteous will be judging somebody. So we're in heaven, assisting with judgment. Satan's on earth, bound by circumstances. After the resurrection and going on into eternity, the Christ, uh, Christ the saints, and the city, the new, new Jerusalem, all descend upon earth. We're going to look at the passages that explain this. The wicked dead are raised. 
They're going to come up in that resurrection to condemnation that Jesus spoke about. The second one, they have to be raised in order to face judgment. First, they were just, and there's a reason why they don't get judgment immediately. We go to heaven first, then they face their judgment. We'll explain that. Then there's the last judgment. Then Satan and sinners are destroyed forever. They don't burn forever in hell. God torturing them relentlessly and unendingly. That's not what scripture teaches. They are destroyed. And then earth is cleansed. The first time God destroyed this planet, he did it with water. The promise is he would never flood. When you see a rainbow in the sky, the rainbow is God's symbol. And it symbolizes his promise that he would never destroy the earth again with water. But it will be destroyed by fire in the end. And we'll look at that too. Peter says the elements will melt with fervent heat. It's going to be destroyed in order to eradicate sin. Earth will be cleansed and then the new earth will be created. That's what happens before, during, and after the resurrection. I guess I have a, I can, <laughs> could have been clicking through this. I have this here. Before, it's the second coming. During, the saved are in heaven. These are the highlights. And then after, the third coming, when there's the second resurrection. How does the Bible describe the effect of the second coming on lost people? Jeremiah 25, 33 says this. At the <clears throat> Excuse me. At that day, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. So Jesus comes back. The righteous are taken. The slain wicked are just left. There is no one to bury them. They're just like refuse on the ground. What will be the condition of planet Earth during the 1,000 years? In Jeremiah 4, 23, and then verse 25, we read, I beheld the Earth, and indeed it was without form and void. That's what it was at, before creation, right? The Hebrew is tohu wavohu. I love that. Doesn't that just roll off your tongue? Isn't that beautiful? Tohu wavohu. <laughs> it's void and formless. It's empty. There's nothing. Formless and void and and the heavens, they had no light. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. So before God created this earth, it was void, it was formless, and then he began to fashion it into a beautiful, habitable planet for us. By the way, John, you may talk about this when you're going to present later, uh, in, beginning tomorrow night. We'll, if you come early, you'll hear... Um, a, a short presentation on creation facts. When people date fossils, they're not really dating the fossil, they're dating the rock that the fossil was found in. And um, when they date them to billions of years ago, there's a problem because recently a dinosaur bone was found that has soft tissue inside it, right? You're going to talk about that. And that wouldn't last for billions of years. Okay, so that helps tell us that it, wasn't, it was kind of recent that dinosaurs were on this planet. Um, and interestingly, the, the evolutionist scientists are all trying to explain it in some interesting way. <laughs> Even the lady who discovered it, there's no way to explain it other than that it's a young earth. But anyway, um, the earth was void and formless. So when they date these rocks, saying they're dating fossils, they're dating the material that the rocks were made of that the fossils were found in. We do not know when it says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, we don't know when that was. That's the beginning. But later, and this earth with after the Big Bang, as we may call it, when God created all matter, we don't know how many billions of years may have passed before he said, now it's time to make planet Earth habitable and make it a world in which people and animals and plants can live. And so at that time, he begins to take that matter that was created and shape it into a, living, a livable world. Um, so they're dating the stuff that's been around forever, but not maybe since life has been around. Uh, that, I'm just saying that because it connects to void and formless. The world will be like that again in the sense that there's no life on it except the life of Satan and his evil angels. There was no man and all the birds of the heavens had fled. Jesus said in Luke 17, 28 through 30, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. 
That's all normal stuff. Life is just going on as normal. People are doing their thing. That's all happening. And he says that's how it's going to be in the end days. But on that day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. They didn't see it coming. They just were going about their lives thinking, oh, we don't have to fear judgment. We don't need to worry about it. God went, tried to find righteous people, and the only ones saved were Lot and his family in that, that area. They were all unrighteous. It destroyed them all. <clears throat> and then Jesus says this, even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. People are going to just be chugging along thinking the world will never come to an end. They're going to deal with the problems. Say, we have to fix this planet, all the problems we're dealing with, but they're going on with their daily lives and their business and not thinking about Jesus returning to fix the planet. And that is the only solution to the mess we've made. What will the righteous be doing in heaven during the millennium? Revelation 20, verse 4 says, I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. That's the righteous. So the righteous are committed to, they have a commission to exercise judgment. They're going to be judging. Whom? What? Well, in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 2 and 3, Paul tells us, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? So judging, the, remember, the world refers to those who are worldly. Judging those who are lost. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? So people and angels will be judged by the righteous. And that happens during the millennium, which we just read, remember? Right there. I saw thrones, they sat on them, and the judgment was committed to them. That's after the saints have gone to heaven. What will Satan be doing during the millennium? Revelation 20, verse 7 says, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. Remember, it's a prison of circumstances. So something's going to change which will allow him to go back to employment. He's released from the unemployment prison. He's put out of commission for a while. He can't deceive anyone anymore. But now he's no longer imprisoned by his circumstances. What remarkable event takes place at the end of the 1,000 years? Revelation 20, verse 5. The rest of the dead did not live again until the 1,000 years were finished. So that means there will be a resurrection. It's the resurrection of the lost or the wicked or the unrighteous, the unsaved, whatever you want to call them. Those that were not taken to heaven with Jesus. They're going to be resurrected at the end of 1,000 years to the resurrection of condemnation. And that's why Satan is released from his prison, because now there will be people on this planet again that he can deceive. He is the great deceiver. And he's going to go about his business of deceiving the ones who were lost. He'll deceive them one more time. He, he already deceived them enough that they were lost. Now he's got another deception for them before the very end. What other event marks the end of Revelation's 1,000 years? Something else happens at the end of the millennium. Revelation 21.2. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. New Jerusalem coming to this planet. God says, it's as if he says, I'm going to make this planet the center of the universe. I'm going to make it my throne now because I paid everything in order to save this planet and the people on it. And he sets up the New Jerusalem right here. What will Satan influence the wicked to do when they are raised from the dead? Revelation 20, verses 7 and 8. When the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and go out to deceive the nations. We read that already. Which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. That Gog and Magog are used as terms to represent the people opposed to God. To gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. If you can think of all the people through all of Earth, planet Earth's history who will be lost, Jesus says, broad is the gate and wide is the way to destruction, but narrow for those that are saved, which means more will be lost than saved. So there's going to be a lot of people on this planet resurrected from all the different ages. Many of them were great generals warmongers. They were brilliant military geniuses. And many of them are criminals and criminal minds and 
horrible people who have done the worst sins and did not confess and repent. Those are the people he's working with. That's his deception, or dis, people to deceive. That's the material he's working with, right? So he's going to take those and convince them that they should go to battle. Um, when they have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, go out to deceive the nations which are going to gather them together to battle. So he's going to convince them to go to battle against whom? Well, not themselves. Right against the city of God, the New Jerusalem. How does God end this attempted overthrow of the holy city? Revelation 20, verse 9. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. That's the wicked. They're surrounding the city now. They're ready to attack. Satan has got them convinced. Look, out here we're lost. There's our only hope. And look how many of us there are. We can take it. And he orchestrates this one final attack against God. He is that deluded and that deranged and that intent on opposing God that he's going to go one more time in battle against him. And what happens? And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. There's hellfire. That's the second death. Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. Remember I told you hellfire won't burn forever because they won't be alive forever. It says they're devoured. They're gone. They're consumed. That's actually good news. Can I tell you something? We have time. I'm going to tell you this. I love hell. Here's what I mean by that. <laughs> I love the doctrine of hell, the teaching of hell. And the reason is because, remember I told you the other night, I came to God initially out of fear of hell. I said, I don't want to burn for all eternity because I'm enjoying a life of sin now. It's not a fair trade. It doesn't seem like, you know, it doesn't make sense. I better get right with God because I don't want to burn. I had a fire escape religion, right? So in order to escape the fire, I said, I better turn to God. But when I studied this very kind of, this topic, I went to a seminar in a church in Allentown, Pennsylvania, new Christian, and I went to a seminar on the book of Revelation, and as I'm studying that, and I, someone taught me, it was the head elder of the church was leading the seminar, and he taught us this, uh, this teaching that hell does not burn forever and ever, that a loving God would not do that. And I'm sorry we don't have time to do that in this series, but you will get the lesson to study on your own. It's very clear in scripture that hell is not eternal. And I thought, this is amazing. This is wonderful. Because even though I had become a Christian, I still was living in the fear that, what if I'm lost in the end? You know, I, there's no guarantee. I could lose my way. I could turn my back. We all are still free moral agents. I don't believe the Bible teaches once saved, always saved. I had a Christian friend once tell me, once you accept the blood of Jesus, it doesn't matter. You can commit any sin you want, and you're saved. I said, really? What? You mean even if I go out and become a murderer, I'm going to be in heaven? Yes, because the blood of Jesus covers you. <laughs> so my heart has to stay changed in love with Jesus, right? Anyway, I did realize in my mind I didn't believe what she said. I thought a person can be lost even after they've given their heart to Jesus. They can make the choice because God never takes away your freedom of choice. We are free or moral agents. And I thought, what if I'm lost one day? I still feared hell. And then I heard this teaching about what the Bible really teaches on hell. And I said, that is wonderful news. Because now I understand that the very worst thing that could happen to me is that I could be lost and it would be over when I'm consumed in the fires of hell. And I would not suffer for all eternity. And I said, hallelujah, praise Jesus. To me, that was good news. Do you realize how good God is? That even those who hate him and reject him, he won't cause them to suffer forever. I once went to a prophecy seminar. Listen, folks, you're in a prophecy seminar where I hope you can go home from this and you can tell your friends, I'm hearing prophecy taught from the Bible and it makes sense. I went to a prophecy seminar once because, uh, you know, I was always, I'm always trying to connect with Christian friends, no matter what their denominational affiliation. And I had a friend from a church who said, oh, come, I invited them to a prophecy seminar. They said, oh, my church is doing a prophecy seminar too. You should come to my prophecy seminar. I said, okay, I'll go. 
They never came to ours. But I went to theirs. And there at the prophecy seminar, I heard this pastor. You know, a, a, a special high power guy they brought in from out of town. And he says, man, one day God is going to punish the wicked. He's going to burn them forever in the fires of hell. If I were God, I would do it now, he said. <laughs> he said, it's a good thing. I'm, I'm, no, I'm thinking it's a good thing you're not God. Because he, he said, I was out on the golf course the other day, and I heard some guys cussing and taking the Lord's name in vain. And I thought, if I were God, I would zap them right then and there. They don't deserve the air they're breathing. This guy's up there preaching away like that. And I thought, thank God you're not God. Because some of those people who are taking the Lord's name in vain may eventually find Jesus and know him as their Savior. And he would want to zap them, right? It's like James and John said, shall we fire, call fire from heaven down on them, Lord? <laughs> Jesus says, no, you don't even know what you're talking about. All right. So I don't like this picture of God who is finding pleasure in torturing the wicked. And I don't find it in Scripture. I talked to a young lady who grew up in a church where she was taught hellfire consume, or doesn't consume, but burns forever, and God miraculously keeps people alive so he can keep on torturing them all eternity. And she said, I left. She was into um, Hinduism and yoga at the time that I met her. She was the daughter of one of my neighbors. My son was setting off fireworks. Everybody came out at night to say, what's going on? And, oh, we're having little fireworks here. And it's celebrating Independence Day. And, and then we got to talking, because she came out on the street. And she, I, she asked about me, said, I'm a pastor, and then we got to talking, and she said, well, I, I grew up in the church, but I left because of I can't love a God who will burn me for all eternity. And I said, you know what, I can't either. And then when I told her what the Bible teaches about hell, she said, wow, you just gave me a reason to reconsider coming back to the church. I said, well, it's, it's what the Bible teaches. And whenever you understand what the Bible teaches, God is irresistible. He's nothing but all of, altogether lovely, and we're drawn to him. What a loving, wonderful God. So that's why I say, I love hell. Because even if people say, I don't want anything to do with God, in his goodness and his mercy, he says, all right, you have that choice. If you don't want to be connected to the source of life, you will be consumed and die, and you will not have life, but you won't be alive forever to sin and be in misery. All right. What does God do once this final rebellion has been put down? Revelation 21.1 says, I saw a new heaven. This is John in vision. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Uh, that's interesting because the sea is what was separating John from everybody. He was on the Isle of Patmos, kind of the Alcatraz of his time and place. And uh, I once went to the prison on Alcatraz when we lived in Napa Valley. Uh, we went down to San Francisco on the 50th anniversary of the closing of Alcatraz. And they had a special event. You could go and tour the, the jail, the prison, and you could also meet, they called in former guards and former prisoners, those that were still alive from when it closed 50 years before. So there's an elderly man in his 70s that I, I found most fascinating. I talked to different guards and prisoners, but this one guy was telling his story about his life in Alcatraz. And he said, you know, one of the worst things was we were so close to civilization. On New Year's Eve, when the girls were laughing, they were drinking in San Francisco there by the pier. We could hear the laughter and hear the people partying, and yet we're separated by that sea of water that we couldn't cross. And uh, he said that was the hardest part. And John was separated from those he loved and from his church family when, you know, they, tradition says they tried to kill him by boiling him in oil. And God said, no, I'm not done with him yet. We got the book of Revelation to, to get out yet. And so God preserved his life and then they, they couldn't kill him, so they put him on Alcatraz, Patmos. Patmos, the Alcatraz of his day. And then um, <clears throat> John says there's no more sea in this new earth. There's nothing separating. And actually, when God created the earth, uh, creation scientists will tell you that there was probably one Pangaea. There was one landmass. And I'm, I, I don't want to be stealing your thunder, but it's just part of what I, I love to talk about. 
And, and the, the sea, the part of the planet that was water, was much smaller. And John says, that's how the new earth will be. In Revelation 21, 4, God says, uh, that he, it says that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I love that verse. Amen. I always, you know, I've done my uncle, who was like a father, done, I've done his funeral, done my brother's funeral, done my next brother's funeral, and last year I did my dad's funeral. And I always include this verse because it's a beautiful promise. God himself, the hand that created Adam and Eve, created Adam and then extracted Eve, that same hand will wipe away our tears. The former things have passed away. That's all over with now, he says. Nothing but joy, bliss, and perfection to enjoy. How does the book of Revelation describe God's relationship with his people in the earth made new? In verse 3 of Revelation 21, it says, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the ta so by the way, so John is seeing the future in vision. So he's seeing all this, and then this is what we're going to hear. We'll hear it when it happens. When, when the loud voice says, Behold, the tabernacle or the dwelling place of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. That's not just ladies, you're not excluded, okay? And kids, it's humans when it says men, okay? He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. In other words, God's original plan will be restored. We will be one-on-one one -on -one in fellowship with God again. We'll be face-to-face. -face. Sin will no longer separate us. Because a holy God, in the presence of sinful beings, will not work. But when he deals with the sin problem, and we can be reunited again, there's what we'll have community together with God. Three points to remember from this lesson. The millennium begins at the second coming of Jesus. We will be in heaven during the millennium. The lost will be slain and on the surface of the earth, but we will be with God in heaven. Judging, um, I, sh I should say a word about this because I don't know if we're going to have time to get into it later, but we, re we read where Paul says that we'll judge Angels and people? Well, who are we judging? Which angels and which people? The wicked. And why are we doing that? God is revealing to us everything he had done. We have a thousand years to have all our questions answered. Some of you, when we get there, some people might say, what is Krauss doing here? I knew that rascal. I'm talking about me. <laughs> and God can say, well, that rascal turned his life around and accepted Jesus. And some will say, well, where is this person? I surely knew, certainly that famous preacher is going to be here. And what if they're not there? God can reveal, well, in their heart, they really weren't what they were professing, right? So whatever the circumstances, may, I'm, I'm just, I'm not thinking of anyone in particular, but we will have questions about who's there and who's not there. God says, I'll answer all of that. We have a thousand years to talk about. And why did you let this happen on earth, Lord? I'll answer that question. And everything will be answered. And what about this in my life? Oh, and why did you allow the Holocaust? And whatever, you have all the questions you can ask, he's got answers for them. We have a thousand years to get that all settled. And then also, why will he do what he's going to do after the millennium? Listen, if we don't have it settled in our mind that God is fair and just by the, during that thousand years, how would we ever be able to experience what's going to happen? We will, whether you're watching or not, you're going to know what's happening outside the city when God brings fire down and destroys the wicked. We've got to get it settled. And yeah, we might, we'll know some people out there, even if it's just, you know, a neighbor or something. We'll, we're bound to know somebody that didn't make it to heaven. And we're going to know that they're going to burn. But we've got it settled in our mind because we just spent a thousand years with God and we see who he is, and we understand his beautiful character, and we had all our questions answered, and we know that what he's doing, about to do, is fair and just, because he gave every opportunity, and these people who are free moral agents exercised their power of choice, and they made the decision not to accept his invitation for eternal life. And so when he cleanses the planet with fire so that he can make it new, 
they'll be cleansed along with it. But they'll be raised up so that they can know the truth before they die. They can know God was real. If they denied him, they'll know he gave them every opportunity and they can see. Because it says that every tongue will confess. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. By the way, do I dare share this with you? You'll still love me no matter what. My kids are going to college in Tennessee, and my in-laws live in northern Georgia. And so when we drive between Tennessee and northern Georgia, there's this billboard on the highway that I, I chuckle every time I see it. It says, every, you know, in the Bible Belt, you see a lot of billboards about the Bible, which is great. And this one, it says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. That's biblical. That's great. I love it. And then at the bottom, it says, even the, and I'll leave it blank, but it's one political party is mentioned. <laughs> and I thought, well, <laughs> that's not in the Bible, but it's interesting. <laughs> so everyone will bow and admit Jesus is Lord, even the lost. They'll have that opportunity to at least know I'm getting what I deserve. God gave me the opportunity, and I rejected it. All right, but God will be vindicated. Okay, so that's where we'll be. And then the millennium ends at the third coming. That's when Jesus comes with the city. And then finally, after the millennium, you know, people think they're going to spend eternity in heaven. I say, no way. That's just a short 1,000-year vacation. That's just the start of eternity. We don't spend eternity in heaven. We spend most of eternity on planet Earth. We just start out in heaven for 1,000 years. Then the city comes down and... God says, let's get back to the original plan. This is your home. I made it perfect for you. We had this problem of sin that interrupted for a few thousand years, but that's done away with now. Let's get back to good living the way I intended it. And then I think we'll probably be able to have the opportunity to travel all around. You know, SpaceX and Elon Musk and everybody, they're planning space travel. They got nothing compared to what we have coming to us when, one day when, when God allows us to travel the universe, right? All right. So... I hope that this has been clear to you. The Bible is clear that the 1,000 years of peace will begin after the second coming. Some people have taught there's going to be 1,000 years of peace before Jesus comes. No, that's not what the Bible says. After the second coming, the peace will be, we'll be at peace in heaven, and the earth will be kind of peaceful because Satan has no one to deceive anymore. And uh, we will not be on planet earth during the millennium, but in heaven with Jesus. Clear? All right, next time, come back tomorrow night, we're going to study the second coming of Jesus. There's a lot of misinformation about that. What will it be like? Will there be a secret rapture of God's people before that? Boy, what if I'm flying on a plane and the pilot's a Christian and Jesus raptures him away and the plane goes down? I don't know. How many people will see Jesus when he returns? Because some say, well, Jesus is, has already come. So it was a secret coming. We'll see. We'll answer those questions tomorrow night. I hope you'll be with us. And those of you watching online, hope you'll be back to continue in our study together as well. Let's, be, let's end with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love, your blessings. And thank you for the Bible. Thank you that it was preserved through all these ages. There are people who wanted to destroy it and wipe it out, and yet you have preserved it. If you inspired people to write these holy words, certainly you will... Uh, protected, and you have done so through the ages. And certainly, not only did you inspire your word and protect it over the ages, but now you help us to understand it by sending your Holy Spirit. So we pray that you'll continue to do so. Keep bringing light to our minds. Give us understanding so that we can take your word and apply it and live it and be blessed by it. Thank you for the teaching of the millennium and for the promise that you will come back one day soon and we'll get to go home with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, good night, God bless.